to everybody this morning. Thanks for being here. Um, we're getting ready to start a, um, we're launching a new series. Um, I love my church. Actually, um, kind of today is National Back to Church Day, whether you knew that or not. So welcome to or back to church, um, So, which is kind of a cool thing. We ended up landing on I love my church on National Back to Church Day. So uh, before we dive in this morning, let me really quickly uh, just do a little housekeeping. Um, I want to ap- apologize for last week's message, if I, if I could do that. And, and I certainly don't apologize for the content of God's word. Um, but my wife reminds me often, it's not what you say, but how you say it. And, and I, we were preaching about God's love, and, it, and I listened back later. I'm like, I was angry. Like, I was just tired. And, and, it, and so I apologize the way that came across last week. I hope, it may not have seemed like it, but I, I hope you realize I, I do love my church. I, I really do. And a lot, we're like, after last week, I'm not sure you love anything. Like, you're like cranky and tired and go take a nap, which was a very spiritual thing. I actually did that. I took a nap. It was a spiritual thing. Um, so to get us going this morning, we're just going to kind of jump in. Let me put this word in front of you and ask you, what do you think when you see that word? First thing that pops to your mind, no churchy answers. No churchy answers. Yeah. What do you, what do you think of? You can just shout stuff out. Home. Home? home. Somebody say home. That's cool. All right. Steeple. I heard steeple. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes um, when you talk to people, um, you, when you talk about church, a lot of times it is. It's stone or it's steeples or it's services, right? We always, I always thought that was such a weird word to use. Like we have church services and I realized like when we come here, we're really not serving anybody. Like, we're just, we're just sitting around. So, um, so I always thought that was a weird word, but I, I kind of get what it means. Um, rules, that comes up a lot of times when you talk to people about church. They think about rules or regimen. Like, there's, there's this regiment that we go through and these rules. Choirs and robes, depending on, like, maybe where you grew up. Maybe you grew up in a church where they had a big choir loft and they would all dress alike and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, long, boring talks. How many, how many when you think of church? Like, nobody said it, but you were all thinking it. I could tell. Like, and, there, and some of you guys have already checked your watch. We will get you out for the Packer Viking game. I promise you. Like, we, I promise you. So that, we want you to come back to church, right? So we don't want to upset you today. Um, buildings and Bibles and, you know, just boring talks and budgets and bands. And, and a lot of those things kind of get kind of mixed up in the idea of church. But my, my question, I guess, this morning is, are those things, when we think about church, and especially if it's, you know, if we're not real deep on that thought, but when we think about it, are those things an accurate picture of what church is really supposed to be? Or is church supposed to be something other than that? Else, something else, something other than that. So interestingly enough, um, the word church, at least the way we tend to use it, doesn't even show up in our Bible. And you're like, I can turn to a verse right now and like show you the word church. And I know you can, but, but just stick with me for just a second. Um, wherever you read the word church in your English Bible, it's really not the original word, right? So you, you'd have to kind of read Greek and understand Greek, all that kind of good stuff. But, but let me just give you a quick translation lesson because language matters, like words matter. And, and this is really one of those unfortunate substitution lessons. So uh, a lot of times our Bibles, the way we got our Bible is somebody translated from like original languages, right? So Old Testament Hebrew, New Testament Greek, and they kind of translated it and kind of gave us their best take. This is one of those like unfortunate substitution lessons. So let me just show you real quick. This might be the boring part, but we'll get it out of the way at the beginning, right? So here's, here's the thing. The word church is an English take on a German word. That's the German word. The German word is Kirch or Kirke would, is another way to say it. And, and, it's, and in, what this actually means, it was a translation of the original Greek word, right? My slides are not working here. Something just happened. Um, Here we go. Whoops. There's the original Greek word. So the original Greek word that they got kerche from was the Greek word kodiakos, right? And you don't have to know this word. You're not going to use it in a sentence. If you do, there's bonus points. Like if you use that word in a sentence this week, like just drop it on somebody. It's like, that's so kodiakos. Like they won't even know what you mean, but that's pretty cool. But here's what that word actually means, right? The word kodiakos, it means pertaining or belonging to a lord. That's, that's, that's all it means. Kurios is, is Lord. So this original Greek word, right? This Greek word, kuriakos, only shows up in the Bible twice. That's it. That word, which gave us kerche, which gave us church, that word only shows up in the Bible two times. And let me show you the verses. Here's the first time it shows up. 1 Corinthians 11.20. It says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's, kuriakos, supper you eat. It's saying, hey, here's, when you come together, it's not... The Lord's Supper you eat. And, and you have to read in context. 
Paul was kind of getting on this church because they were making a mockery out of the Lord's Supper. Like it turned into a big feast and some people were eating a lot and, no, and people were showing up and not eating at all. And it was just kind of a mess. Here's the other, here's the other, whoop, I'm, our slides are, you got me? Yeah, I got you. Okay. Something's, something's kind of wacky with our, we actually have internet today, which we didn't last week. Uh, maybe that's why I was so angry. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, it's amazing what happens when you take away these things. Here's the other time this word shows up, right? The other word, the other time it shows up, it's in Revelation 1.10, and John is writing, and he says, I was in the spirit on Kodiakos Day, right? The Lord's Day. It says, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet. Lord's Day was a Sunday, right? So he was trying to help us understand this is the same day I was running. Here's the thing, though. Over time, this word, kirche, came to mean the Lord's house. So that German word became, came to mean the Lord's house. And, and, and the English word, unfortunately, came to mean a building or a place of worship. So that's what church started to mean. It started to mean like a building or a location or, or a house of worship, which was never really what this next word was supposed to mean, right? So here's, here's the next word. Here's the actual I'm going to be like looking behind me like all morning, I can tell, because I don't know where we're at. Um, so here's the word that shows up that 112 times out of 115, the English translators translated this word to church. And then if you were living in the 1500s, church meant a building or a place, stones and steeples and services and robes and boring talks and all that stuff. But that's the word that actually shows up in the Bible, the original Greek, and they translate it to the word church, which is really one of those kind of unfortunate things. Because the other three times they came to this word, instead of using the word church, the English translators chose this word, assembly, which is a better translation. That's actually accurate. That's what that word means. That's what it really, but interesting enough, if you read the, the word assembly, it shows up three times in the book of Acts, and it talks, one of them, it's talking about a riot. Um, the next time, it's talking about dismissing a riot. And then the next time, it was talking about a group of people that was like serving in like a, in like a, a court or a public place where they would hear people bring their, their stories or their, or their issues or whatever it may be. And it uses the word assembly. And, and all this is, I know this is all just background. And you're like, what does this have to do with anything? Let me just show you what the actual word means, right? The word ecclesia, right? Um, you got me? I don't know. This is going to be... Okay. All right. So that's what that word ecclesia actually means. And the, the literal meaning of the word ecclesia is the called out ones, right? Ek is out, right? How many of you have ever had a tonsil ectomy? Anybody have a tonsil ectomy? Appendectomy? Oh, wow. Thanks, Grady. This one works? I can throw this one? <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah, so if you've ever had like a tonsil ectomy or appendectomy, right? Ek is out. Tomia, Greek word means tomi means a cut. But that's what that means. So out, ek, and klesia is called. Kaleo means to call out. So it's a, it's a really interesting term that unfortunately got substituted with the word church, which is really kind of, a, kind of a weird word when you ask people what they think it means. So when you think about this, it's a group of people that could assemble for a specific purpose. That's what an ecclesia was. The Greek term ecclesia meant this is a people that can assemble in one place and carry out a specific thing, a specific service. Whether in one case it was to carry out a riot. In another case it was to carry out uh, judicial work. But in most cases when Jesus used it, it meant something completely <laughs> different in the idea of, of, what, of, a, of a people that was going to carry out his mission. So, so when Jesus began his church... His ecclesia, just so we understand, he was never talking about a place. He was always talking about a people. It was never a location. It was never a building. It was always a place. It was always a people. He wasn't talking about buildings with monuments. He was talking about an assembly of people with momentum that could carry out what he had called them to, right? So, and I, how many, I use this phrase all the time, but I shouldn't. I, I, I still use this phrase. You know, hurry up, you guys. We got to get ready to go to church. Anybody else kind of say that? I've, I've said it my whole life. I've heard it my whole life when I was a kid. You know, my parents like, come on, let's go. We got to get to church. We say it, and, and, but when I think about it, if, if we had said that, if we had said that phrase in the first century around Jesus followers, they would have looked at us like we were crazy because the church wasn't a location to go to. 
The church was a group of people. It was a people that would gather. It wasn't a location that we would have to hurry up and go to, right? The church was not, was never intended to be a place. It was and it is a people. So I want us to just kind of take a look. The first time um, the word shows up, right, in the New Testament, this word ecclesia shows up because I think we'll learn something about, about church, right? So in Matthew 16, and if you could turn there if you want, we'll have the verses up here. But Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples about who people around in that time think he is. He, he's been doing ministry for a while, and, and he's asking his disciples, these, this close knit of, of followers, about his growing popularity and who people say he is. And so this conversation ensues, and this is what he says. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets, which is kind of a strange thing, because none of these people were living. Like John the Baptist had passed away just previously, Elijah had passed away, Jeremiah had passed away, so it was kind of an interesting, I always thought that was a strange response. But he says, that's what people are saying about you. Then Jesus, he asked this incredibly personal an incredibly important question, and, and I'll be honest with you, this is a question every one of us has to wrestle with at some point, should wrestle with at some point, right? Here's the next question Jesus asks. Who do you say that I am? And, and I, I just want to encourage you this morning, of all the questions you have to answer in your life, that's the most important one. Who is he? Is he Lord? Is he lunatic? just a legend, you know, who, who, who is he? And, and so he poses this question to this, this group of, of, of guys that had been following him around for a little while. And here's one of the responses that came forward, right? The one that tended to be most vocal, Peter kind of steps up and he says, you are the Christ, which doesn't hold a lot of weight in our culture, like that word. But in that day and time, that was huge, he basically said, you are the anointed one from God. You're the promised one. You're the one that for thousands of years we've been hearing about that was supposed to come and rescue us and save us. And we're not even sure what all that means quite yet, but we think you're him. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one from God, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or Simon, son of John, right? For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, that you didn't just hear the stories and went, okay. But he says, but my father who is in heaven, that somehow you heard the stories, but God, my father has drawn you into this understanding and into this conclusion that somehow you realize that I'm more than just a legend, that I'm more than just a prophet, that I'm more than just a, a good teacher. You recognize that I'm actually the son of God, the son of the living God, right? And then Jesus says this, and this is where things get a little bit unwieldy, right? He says, and I tell you, you are Peter. The word's Petros, and it means a large rock. And, and, and what's really cool about this, if, and, and I'm kind of filling in a little bit for you. I encourage you if, you, if you like history and geography and all that kind of stuff, study some of this stuff out. It's really interesting. They're in the region of Caesarea Philippi, which is kind of a cool area. Um, they believed that the Jordan River had its origin from that area, from Caesarea Philippi. They actually believed the Jordan River actually flowed out, started from a cave that was in Caesarea Philippi. That cave was known as the Cave of Pan, which was a, a pagan god. They, the, 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 the Romans and the Greeks in that time worshipped this guy. They called him Pan, which I started thinking, like, I don't, is Peter Pan? Like, is there a connection? Like, is, is that, I love that movie. Is that like a cult thing? Like, I'm like all freaked out about it now. But, um, so now I'm looking for hidden messages in the, the movie Peter Pan. I'm like, oh, they went into a cave. I don't know what that means. And, but, um, but it's, it's an interesting thing. So it happens to be a cave that's in a large rock. And so Jesus is standing there by this large rock. And he says, hey, you're Peter. You're a large rock. And then he says, and, and, and which is an interesting thing, because that word, Greek word, is ice, E-I-S. And it's actually translated but in most passages. Most passages, E-I-S is translated as the word but. So not in addition, but instead. He says, but on this rock. And he uses a different Greek word. Instead of the word petros, 
he uses the word Petra. So he says, hey, this, Peter, you're, you're rocking. Uh, we'd probably call him Rocky. That's what we would name him now. Peter, you're Rocky. But on this huge rock-like Gibraltar, I'm going to build my church. And, and, the, and, and I believe that Jesus was inferring himself, that he was talking about himself. On this rock, this huge rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, which is kind of an interesting thing, too. When you read through this, the cave of Pan, on each side of the cave of Pan, there was these stone monuments, and they called the cave of Pan the gate to the underworld. They believed it was the gate to Hades or the gate to... And so he's standing right in front of this and telling people all of the darkness that's associated with, with pagan worship, with worshiping anything and anyone other than me, it's not going to prevail against what I'm doing and the people I'm doing it in, and the people I'm assembling together to carry this out, right? So uh, I want us to just take a couple of mental notes real quick, right? So Jesus wasn't constructing a building or establishing a location, right? So, so I don't know where, like, where you land with your belief or church or those kinds of things, and I'm, I'm certainly not here to like, pick on any religions. That's not my call. I just want to share with you what God's Word teaches, but God's Word teaches that His church doesn't reside in one single location, right? There's not like the church and it's like it's in Rome or whatever it may be. That he says, hey, there's, I'm building a group of people. I'm, I'm initiating a movement of called out people. Here's the other thing. Jesus said it was his church. It's always good to remember that, right? It's his church. So this church belongs to Jesus. He has sole possession of it. So he gets to define our purpose and direct our pursuits. I, I know our title is I Love My Church, it's not my church, but I like the idea that we, we have a part and we have kind of some ownership and we have some participation in, in, in this place, in this body, this local church. Jesus says he has sole possession. And so I think that has to mean he considers his churches to be very important. Uh, I, I, I believe the local church is so important, I'm willing to, to risk making a, a somewhat controversial statement this morning. And so everybody just like hold your booze and your tomatoes and stuff for, for, for just a second. Here's the statement and just let me, let me walk us through the statement, right? So I'm going to shock you first and I'll hopefully talk you off the ledge in just a second. Here's the first statement. I don't believe you can love Jesus without loving his church. And I know you're like, what? I can't be a Jesus lover. Like, uh, and so just... Just take a breath for just a second. I know maybe this is kind of hitting you in a weird place. But here's, here's something Jesus said. So I think we should give it some credibility. Jesus said this in John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And, and I grew up in church where the, the keep your commandments part was heavy. <laughs> like, do that. The, the sentence says, if you love me. It, it's constructed in the Greek in a way that the first part of the sentence is where the emphasis lies. So the emphasis lies on the if you love me. What? You'll keep my commandments if you really love me. So here's an interesting thing. Did you know that there are 59 commandments in the New Testament that are directed specifically to local church members? Did you know that? 59 commandments in the New Testament that you can't fulfill without being part of a local church. Just walk with me here. Think about this. There are commandments written specifically to church members, things like be devoted to one another, honor one another, accept one another, instruct one another, serve one another, carry one another's burdens, encourage one another, stir up one another. That verse actually, right after that, it talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Back to that idea of we have to be able to gather together to be able to do some of these things. And the list goes on and on. Here's the interesting thing. When the New Testament talks about one another, more times than not, it's referencing a relationship within a local body, within a church coming together and working together and loving each other and serving each other. Here's the point. We cannot fulfill the commandments of Christ without being involved with his people. I can't one another without one another, right? We walked down this a few weeks back. We can't one another without one another. And there's a lot of one another's in the New Testament. And here's the thing I want us to understand. So God doesn't just birth children and then leave them on their own. That's part of what we're doing as we connect in with, with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, as we're following up with folks that have, that have stepped into a new relationship. They've been born again through faith in Jesus. And the cool thing is, is God doesn't just birth children and go, well, you're on your own to grow and develop. 
That's why he, has, he put together local churches. That's why he has them. He's like, I need you to be plugged into a group of people that are going to help you grow and develop. And believe it or not, whether you think you have much to offer, you're going to help other people grow and develop as well, which is a powerful thing. So, so this morning, a couple quick minutes, and, and, and then I'll, I'll cut you loose here. We're going we're gonna to look at what the scriptures say a church should be. Like this assembly, these people, these baptized believers that are getting together, what should that be? Scripture says it should be a fellowship. Talks about the church as a fellowship. 242, Acts 242, it says this, and they, and you're like, who's the they? Well, the verse before that talks about people that believed, received Jesus, and then were baptized, and then added to that body that day. So you'd have to, day of Pentecost, there's a lot in that chapter too, but it says that they believed the words that, that Peter spoke that day about who Jesus was, and after they believed, they're like, okay, what do we do next? He's like, hey, you should be baptized. Like, you should tell the world that you're committed. You have a relationship with God through, through baptism. And after that, you should be added to a local body and be a part of that. And so they, these baptized believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And I thought it was interesting. Webster's Dictionary defines fellowship as both a verb and a noun, which I thought was kind of cool. So fellowship isn't just something we do. Fellowship is something we are. It's not just something we do, like, oh, we're going to have a fellowship, right? And it's like an event, and we come together, and we, we eat food, which is, I don't know if all denominations do that, but Baptists do that, like, a lot. Like, we can't fellowship without food for some reason. It's just weird. Um, but, but here's the best working definition I've heard of, of fellowship. It simply is this. Fellows in a ship. That's deep, right? You guys are like, Wow. Glad I came today. But yeah, it's, it's, fellows, it's fellows in a ship. A group of people, a gathering of people, heading in the same direction, working together to reach a common goal. That's kind of what it is, right? Think back to like ancient times and these big, these big ships with these rowing ships, right? That's my thought. That's where I go. I go to this, these large ships with these people rowing, and they all had to be in sync, and they all had to be together, and they had to kind of be heading in the same direction. Otherwise, there was going to be all kinds of problems, right? The right side of the boat's like, nah, I'm going to row backwards. And the other was like, no, we should. It's like this. You're not going to go anywhere. You're just spinning circles. But the idea is, is people uh, heading in the same direction, working together to reach a common goal. Greek word, right? You don't need to know this word. It means, the actual Greek word just means partnership or communion. So the local church is to be an equal partnership where communion and community takes place. Like, I, I loved what Jeannie said when we were talking about what is church? She's like, it's home. That's what it should feel like. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes you walk into your home like, oh my gosh, what's wrong now? You know, so it, it feels like home that way too sometimes. Like the internet's not working again. Like whatever. But it should feel that way, right? Let me, let me just give you this. If this church is to be a fellowship, then the top priority must be harmony. It must be harmony. If, if we're supposed to be heading in the same direction, and guess what that direction is? Ephesians 3.21 tells us the direction is we're supposed to be giving God glory. Like, when people see us, when they see you, when they, they see us as a group, they shouldn't think, well, that's a great group. If they see that, that's wonderful, but it should point to a great father, to our great God. So that's the direction we need to be heading. If that's the direction we're supposed to be going, going to give God glory, then it's incredibly important that we all get along with each other, right? And I'm not saying, you know, you have to be besties, right? BFFs with everybody next to you. Um, if you do, that's cool. And, 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 I, and I understand that. Sometimes personalities, they click better with others. I get that. But it shouldn't become a click, right? This is still a, this is still a, a fellowship, and, and harmony is, is a top priority. Here's something that's interesting. In the book of 1 Corinthians, and if you have to read 1 Corinthians, because that was a church with some, some issues that Paul was writing to and trying to help them iron them out. But in 1 Corinthians chapters 1, 3, 11, and 12, you get the sense that Paul's repeating himself in this letter. 1, 3, 11, and 12, as well as Titus 3, it all teaches us that anything that causes division or discord within the church, Paul says that's a sin. That, that, and, and, and sin is what, what happens when we, when we kind of violate or go against God's commands or his intended purpose, right? So if his intended purpose for us is to continue to have fellowship and be in harmony, anything that disrupts that is a sin. It's pretty powerful. That's heavy, right? I want you to listen to what God says here through the, through the pen of Peter in 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3, 8, 
It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind. Does that mean we all think exactly alike? Gosh, I hope not, because if you all thought like me, we'd be in trouble, because my brain just kind of flies around sometimes. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, that we were agreed in, 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 in what we're thinking and how we're moving. Sympathy. Why is that so important in a church context, in a, in a family con- fellowship context? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and last week was probably a prime example. I, had a, I was fired up, but I wasn't sympathetic. You know, it was like, oh, let's, you know what that does? It, it, doesn't, give me, it doesn't give us the opportunity to, to give credit to what people are walking through right now in their life. And, and, and sometimes when we get so focused in in one area and start, start zooming in, we forget that there's other people that are just walking through stuff right now. And what they don't need is is a sledgehammer of encouragement. What they might need is a hug. Or what they might need is an ear. We talked a little bit about that last week. Like everything went really wrong when Job's friends started talking. Like if they had just stayed quiet, things probably would have went a lot better. Uh, Sympathy is so important. Brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So let me ask you, in that verse, as you read that, how much of the all do you control? Right? He says, all of you. How much of the all do you control? You. You control you. You control you. So the only way this happens is that I have to take that step. I have to take that, that, the initiative to say, you know what? I need to be sympathetic. I need to understand that there's people walking through difficult things that I have no idea about right now. And, and the last thing they need is some pastor standing up on a Sunday morning really tired. And he's just spitting verses at him and... The people, like, there was no, last, you guys weren't here last week. There was nobody on the front row. And I'm like, where is everybody? But then I noticed everybody kept scooting back. Like, they didn't move chairs, but they kept sliding. And I was like, that's dangerous. But here's what Peter says. Do you not, do not replay you, right? He's speaking, like, I control me. So do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Insults. Insults for insults. But on the contrary, you bless For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Peter says that as baptized believers called out, assembled together, we've been called to build fellowship with one another and to be a blessing to one another. He says at the end of the day, are you building fellowship and are you blessing the others that you're in fellowship with? And if you're not, then you're missing the mark on what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be building fellowship and being a blessing to each other, right? The Bible also says the church is a family. And I know sometimes when that gets said, there's some folks that, like, that's not a comforting word for some people. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Like, now we know how to get home or something. Is that part of the, like, we're all supposed to be together heading in the same direction? Is that what that is? Let me guess who that was, the person that's the reddest. I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm going to guess. That's awesome. It's like, I wish it was that easy. I wish God would just like, here, just listen to Siri and you'll make it through life just fine. You'll be good. Just Google map and you'll be great. Um, yeah, family, right? And sometimes when that word shows up, some people just kind of like, man, if you knew my family, that's not such a nice thing. And let me just encourage you if I can, that wasn't God's design for your family either. All right? Like if you've had some bad family experience, let me just share with you, that's not really what God wanted for your family either. So we're, we're a family that's trying to figure out what does God want for us and, and, and how do we start to, to assemble that and put that together. The Apostle Paul, he's writing to this local church in, in Ephesus and he says this. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And, and, and another really quick, let me just give you a quick language thing because I think it's just powerful when you start to pull these things apart and understand. The word household in the Greek is oikos. The word is oikos. And it means a very intimate relationship. It, it means a very intimate relationship. Uh, more than just the word family, which he uses that word in the next ver- chapter actually. In chapter 3, verse 15, Paul uses the word family. That Greek word is patria or patria. It means God is our father. But then he says, 
but you also have a household. And, and let me just give you a quick example. My dad, I'm his son. I will forever be his son, no matter what he says. I'm still, I'm always forever his son. But he lives in Florida. But he's still my father. But I'm not in his household. So there's a distinction that Paul makes in the book of Ephesians between family and household. And it's, a, it's a, an important distinction for us, right? This household or, or this church family that Paul writes about refers to those who are willing to stay connected in proximity and in life in one household. It's, it takes this idea of the family of God, all of those of us that have believed and trusted Jesus as Savior, and then he narrows it down into this local church that he's writing to in Ephesus. He says, hey, you guys have something going on there as a household, as a family. It's important. I had, I had written the introduction to a message one time that talked about the church family, and the message began this way. I have good news and bad news. The good news is the church is a family. The bad news is the church is a family. Um, that sometimes you, you, we, we take kind of the good with the bad and understand that that's just kind of the mix that we get as a family. God tells us that our church is to be a family, which means acceptance of one another is paramount to this church functioning well as a family. You ever, it's so, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I don't want to know this much about you, but uh, ever, ever go to those dysfunctional family reunions? You ever do that? Yeah, God says that's not what that should look like. Like when we come together, we should function well as a family, right? So here's the thing. If this church is a family, then relationships must be a priority. If the church is a family, if this local church, this group that, that God's assembled in this place in this time is a family, then relationships have to be a priority. And relationships can only flourish when we treat one another with respect, right? That, that's when things start to really break down in families, in marriages, between siblings, is when we fail to respect one another. That it's my idea or, or no one's idea. It's my way or the highway. It's like, wait a second. First and foremost, this isn't my church, it's his. So we're going to respect each other. We want to respect one another, right? I want you to listen to what Paul wrote to a young pastor named Timothy about the importance of respect and relationships in the church. Here's what Paul wrote. He said, never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respectfully as you would your own father. Talk to younger men as you would to your own brothers. And for some of you, talk better to young men than you would your own brothers because I've heard you talk to some of your own brothers so talk better than that here's the next thing that Paul says treat older women as you would your mother and treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters as a family it's important that we respect one another and foster close relationships with one another and Paul tells us that the obvious way that we do that the obvious way that we build respect and we develop relationships is in how we talk to one another and how we treat each other respectfully. Not, not lording over, not, not domineering, but, but humble. Here, let me just give you a free verse, right? This one's for free. You don't even have to pay for this one today, right? <laughs> Kidding. Ephesians 4.29. This is how the Amplified Bible. I thought it was pretty awesome. Paul writes this. He says, let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth pretty strong, but only such speech as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others. If it's not moving them forward in their spiritual walk with God, then don't say it, right? As is fitting to the need and the occasion, which I think comes back to sympathy and, and, and sensitivity of understanding that, you know what, I could say something right now, but maybe it's not the right time to say it. Or I could say something incredibly true, but it doesn't come with much love or grace. And it says, you know, just be sensitive about that as is fitting to the need and the occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace to those who hear it. You ever, you ever been in the presence of somebody that's just incredibly gracious? Like, don't you walk away better? I do. I, I you talk with somebody and, and, and all of a sudden you feel like, man, all they did is just deposit blessing and grace into my life. And I walked away better as a result. And he says, that's what should be happening as you guys encounter each other, as you, as you deepen these relationships and as you develop and display respect for one another. Here, here's another thing, and I, I don't want to let 
young people out, you know, I won't let you guys like feel like you're not a part of this conversation because you very much are. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul also says to Timothy, make sure no one looks down on you because of your youth. I know a lot of times we kind of get this idea, well, as they get older, they'll get it. You know what? There's some kids that get it. We learned about a 12-year-old today that got it, right? He was Jesus, so you guys aren't Jesus, but, <laughs> but, but you have a lot of spiritual wisdom. There's some things that happened that I just kind of, I'll be honest, I watched this past church camp experience. It was so amazing to watch these kids just grind away and serve. And, and even in, in, our, in the flood, when we were doing sandbags and people are filling bags and they're, uh, they're breaking their transmissions to ball bags. And I mean, they're just, I watch these young people and go, you know what? These aren't people that have to figure it out one day. These are kids that are already figuring it out. And sometimes I look at them and go, man, I need to figure some stuff out because they kind of get it. And, and sometimes they see through the unimportant and really kind of understand the important at times. In the same breath that Paul would say that to, to tell Timothy, hey, make sure no one's looking down on your youth. He also says, Timothy, be a good example. Be a good example. So adults don't look down on the young people. Young people be a great example. Uh, be who you want to be, right? Kind of, kind of display that. One last thing, and then we'll, we'll wrap this morning. Scripture says that the church is a body, right? There's, there's several verses throughout the Bible that talk about the church as a body. And, and we need to remember that because I don't know what your, what your background, your church background is, um, but this is a good warning for all of us, no matter whether we're here, you're part of Cornerstone, you're visiting for the first time, you have a church experience, and, and maybe it was a good one, maybe it wasn't, but it, it's a good reminder that the church is a body, not a business. It's not a business. And I think things go incredibly wrong when we start to look at the church as a business, right? Because then souls don't matter, bottom lines start to matter. And I'm going to tell you, in God's economy, the bottom line is souls. The bottom line is people. So it's not profitability, it's not promotional, it's people. And we need to be reminded of that. We're a moving, growing organism, not an organization, right? So let me share with you, if you've been placed within this body by God's design and will for your life, then you're a needed part. A couple quick questions, you know. Could you function without one of your hands? Ask Greg. Greg's trying to. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can function without one of your hands, but not as well as you can with two healthy hands, right? Could you function without one of your legs? Yeah, you could, but you can't function as well as if you had two strong legs. And the body, this body, is the same way. It can function without everyone doing their part, but the truth is it'll function a whole lot better when everybody plays their part and uses their gifts and their talents for the common good and the glory of God. I want you to listen to this verse real quick. The Apostle Paul says this on the subject in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, our own body has many parts, right? We, we know that. Injure one and you recognize quickly how important that part is. He says, our own body has many parts. When all these many parts are put together, they're only one body. The body of Christ is like that. that there, should be, there should be collective uh, common good and, and, and contributions and, and everybody coming together and, and working for the, for the common goal. We're going to pick up with this next week. Um, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about our place, like within that local church, like how do we figure that out? And we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. Before we go this morning, um, I, I just want to simply invite you to, to join God's family. I don't know where you're at this morning in relationship with him, but the most important decision you'll ever make is, is an answer to the question that Jesus posed back in Matthew 16 when he says, who do you say that I am? And, and I love what John writes in John 1, 12. He says, but, all, but to all who believed him, and the him is Jesus, and accepted him and what he did, he gave the right to become children of God. And, and so let me just kind of walk you through this a little bit. If this is something you've never really thought about, or maybe you've thought about it, but you're just not sure where you're at, the first question we have to wrestle with is, do you believe there's a God? That's the first question, right? That's where this verse kind of ends with the idea of God, but it's predicated on the idea that we believe there's a God. And so I want to just ask, you know, think about that for a second. Do you believe there's a God? And if you do, do you believe that he wants a relationship with you? And, and, and that's a different question than, do you feel like you deserve a relationship with him? The question is, do you think he wants a relationship with you? And here's the cool thing. In this verse, he just told us that he does. He just said, I want you to become a child. 
I want you to become mine. I want to become your father. So here's the big question for us this morning, right? Do we believe there's a God? Do we believe that he really wants a relationship with us? And if so, what do we have to do to begin a relationship with him? And that's where answers get kind of come all over the board, right? When you start to talk about that, like, do you believe there's a God? A lot of people are like, yeah. Do you believe he wants a relationship with you? I think he might. What do you believe you have to do in order to have a relationship with him? In this one verse, John kind of cuts through it all and gives us the, the, the answer. You know what he said? He said, you got to believe. You mean I don't have to behave a certain way? I don't have to be a Bible reader, churchgoer? No. He says, what you need to do is you need to believe. And that word means to really trust. Trust that God loves you so much that he sent his son to take care of the sin that separates you from God because God's so incredibly holy that he can't receive our sin into his presence. So his son went to a cross, paid for all that, and we get to stand justified in front of God because of what Jesus did for us. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to get to heaven one day and God's not going to look through a book and go, I wonder if you did enough to get here. Because the answer is I will come up short every stinking time. On my best day, I come up short. But the great news is I don't stand before God because of what I've done. I get to stand before God because of what Jesus did for me. That's grace. That's me stepping back going, I don't even deserve to be here. But for some reason, you loved me enough that Jesus died for me, and I just believe that. And I'm going to go on his merit, not my own. And so I want to encourage you today, if that's, if that's where you're at, if you're ready to step into that decision, we want to encourage you to make that decision today. Uh, here's the thing about this idea that I talked about, about trust. A lot of people get kind of confused about what they have to do to kind of get back into God's good, good graces because they believe somehow they've behaved themselves out of God's favor. Like, I can't be good with God because I behaved myself out of his favor. Let me share with you, the whole reason our relationship with God was broken is because trust was broken. It had nothing to really do with your behavior. It had everything to do with our trust. Trust was broken in the Garden of Eden. So the only way for our relationship to be restored is that trust has to be restored. And the only way that happens is I trust. I trust God. Adam and Eve said, God, I don't really trust you. I'm going to go our own way. And God says, the only way we can restore that is you have to trust me. You have to trust what my son did for you. Maybe you're already taking the step this morning. And if God's leading you, I want to invite you and encourage you. You know, take the next steps in that journey, in that, in that faith journey. And I believe that next step is, hey, you want a baptism's a, a huge step. That's a great step. And being part of a, of a local church family. Um, if you're interested in that, want to know more about that, Cornerstone Connection. That's a great place to come. Um, sign up, let us know. We'd love for you to be there. and We'll walk through some of that, some of those questions that you have. Let me give you if you're, one final thing here. If you're here this morning and you're a member here at Cornerstone, and I want to ask you, just consider where you're at as it relates to fellowship, right? Are you building fellowship with others? And are you seeking to be a blessing to others, right? Because I'll, I'll be the first one to admit, church can turn into kind of a routine. I'll be honest, we, we got together with some, some friends last night, and, and, and Carrie and I, which was amazing, and, and they surprised us and celebrated our 25th anniversary and stuff together, which was really cool. And, and, and as we were pulling in, I didn't know where we were going, and, and Paul was giving us a ride in the, in the, in the limo, which was sweet. Um, and so as we're turning, my first thought was, you're taking me to work? Like, but, but, because it was here, and I was like, what's this? No, I'm just kidding. But, but I'll, I, I say all that to say that sometimes that's what church starts to feel like a little bit. Like, oh, it's Sunday, punch the clock, do the thing. <laughs> I want you guys to know God has so much more for us as a group and as a body than just kind of showing up and kind of going through the motions. And I want to encourage you, if you're a member here, like fellowship, are you, are you building fellowship with others? And are you, are you seeking to be a blessing to them? And, and let, me, let me just share with you, as you seek to be a blessing to others, without fail, they will bless you. Typically more than you bless them. It always happens. It happened last night. It, happens, it happened this morning. It happens all the time when we get together. Are church family relationships a priority for you? you know, do the, do, does that, you're like, man, you know what? I miss gathering with these people. I want to make sure that's a priority. I want, to, I want to get together with them. I walk away better as a result. Is there respect for those in your church family? Are you an active and involved part of the body? right? Are you connected and using your gifts and talents for the good of others, the glory of God? We just want to encourage you. 
with that. Like, if you're a member, it's like, these are some things just to think about, pray about. Like, man, am I, am I really involved in the fellowship? Am I, do I feel like these family relationships are really a priority, or is it just something I do on Sunday every once in a while? Am I using my gifts and my talents, right? Um, we're going we're gonna to close in, in prayer in just a second. One thing real quick, as we do, um, Derek and Kim are back here, not to embarrass you guys at all, but they came and they joined us last week. They became a part. They became members here at, at Cornerstone. And we didn't get a chance to really like officially like, hey, welcome. Like we just broke and we were all over the place. I'm going to ask them if they don't mind when we close, I'm going to have you guys stand in the back with me. Let me just give you guys a chance as you go out. If you never met them, meet them. If you've met them, um, you, you love them. If you've met them and don't love them, I'm going to pray for you, right? No, I'm just kidding. So let me, 